Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, we really have a we have quite a show this hour, and, and we want you to join us. And please, I hope you've got your coffee and your tea, and you're sitting back and relaxing, because we've got a subject matter that's that's universal, if you will, nationally, all over the place. And I'm talking about this um, sanctuary city. I mean, you've been hearing that brand for a number of years, if you will, but now it's here, it's reality. And uh, something has to be done, and people are still divided on this issue. I would say that the majority of Americans, and, and again, even people in Oregon, are still having a problem with this issue. The fact of the matter is, we're gonna try to figure out, what we need to do now is try to figure out how can we come to a solution, and how can we talk, and does this resemble some sense of simula- assimilation? And I think that's a, that's a fair charge. So joining me to do, we're gonna talk about this piece, and joining me to talk about this issue will be the chairman of the Republican Party, Bill Currier, and my dear friend Scott, Scott Jurgensen, who happens to have been, if you will, happens to be a Hispanic, American, you know, no problem. Just like myself, I'm a black African American, blah, blah. And, and, and I make that point from the standpoint, you know that this state, we've got over 100 cultures in this country. And a lot of folks don't understand why we, why we are speaking the English language and how we got lackadaisy and got in this English as a second language. The reason why we got English as a language so that in all due respect, we can all come under one roof and we can always share and then we can communicate with one another. But again, that's, that's another subject matter that we will be discussing at some point in time and further detailing just exactly why we are, we are speaking the English language as opposed to English as a second language and, and the impact that this will have on some of the cultures who are having problems saying, okay, I want this culture, I want this culture to speak my language and my language only. And sometimes that can be somewhat confusing. I'm making that point from the standpoint of saying we're getting ready to get into, if we're going to get in discussion of this uh, sanctuary city aspect of it, that's kind of like one aspect of that. Because in all due respect, whenever you say sanctuary city, it almost, it, it just says Hispanic or Mexican automatically. Just like when you say gang members, it's black. You see, you just go through, you can go through all kinds of semantic. So we're going to have a discussion. And so before we do that, though, uh, Bill's going to be coming in here very shortly. I've got Scott here with me. You've seen Scott before, and he's been a, sort of our legislative aide here on the Oregon Voters Digest, giving us sort of updates on, on highlights, if you will, of last week and some of the things that are in the news from a national perspective and each locally. So what we're going to do, we're going to jump right on in and just give it to Scott and say, Scott, give it to us. Start from a national perspective and, now, and then bring it on down home here in Oregon. What's up? The big thing that happened this last week was that Education Secretary Betsy DeVos Uh took a tour of McMinnville High School. Here in Oregon? Yeah. Oh, And I was in the room for part of that. Awesome. Yeah, and so I found out about it the same way a lot of folks did, because you have these different Facebook groups, Mm -hmm. and my friends on the right would send out these invites. Oh, rally to support Betsy DeVos. And then my friends on the left were saying, rally to protest Betsy DeVos. And so... Once I confirmed it, I got the press release and I called the press office and said, okay, well, here's who I am. And Mm -hmm. I've learned to use my clout and my position over time. Said, hey, I heard the Secretary of Education is going to be here. Can I get in the room? And put me in touch with the advance team. And so I I missed the part at the high school, which is where the demonstrations were happening. You know, Mm -hmm. she was taking a tour inside Mm -hmm. and these different groups were outside screaming at each other in the rain, presumably. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards, um, there was a roundtable discussion with students, and that took place at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum over there in McMinnville. Mm -hmm. Um, Private facility, so there was no protests there. I asked them about that. I said, (laughs) no, if people were protesting, we'd have security drag them out of here. Uh And and I did a write-up about it for my publisher's website. I did a a live radio update you know right after it happened Mm -hmm. but for all the yelling and screaming and and all the negative comments that people were making on facebook the roundtable discussion was actually really productive Hmm, and what it was was highlighting the things that they've been doing well in mcminnville high school um and so the title of the article i wrote about it said a national model for education Hmm. um and I think the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, was there to see, kind of to learn about the success that McMinnville High School has had. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they have pathways. Okay. And so they've developed about 17 different career pathways for their students mm-hmm. where 
you express an interest in different areas and you start learning about it, but you also get hands-on experience and you work for, you know, you help out local employers who are in those fields. And they said, it, it's just as important that the students know what they don't want to do ah, okay, for a living. Okay, okay, right? And okay. so it's a very productive discussion happening. And th that's what I said in my write-up. I said, at the end of the day, this isn't about Donald Trump. This isn't about Betsy DeVos. Yeah, yeah. This is about these students and their hopes and their dreams. And the success that they've had at McMinnville High School, that you could probably, if you were to take and duplicate that on a national level, uh, I think education would function more like the way that we think it all should ah, as a great equalizer. Okay, cool. And so as much as you hear people try to demonize Betsy DeVos for whatever reason, you know, they're ideologically opposed to her. I'm thinking, well, this is probably not the worst thing in the world if our secretary of education is trying to learn best practices. Yeah, yeah, says, hey, yeah, you know, I yeah, came from Washington, yeah, D.C. because yeah, I heard you guys are doing some incredible yeah, things yeah, in McMinnville. Yeah, yeah. I want to learn more about it yeah. from you. On that particular note, let's get, let's get Bill, come on in. You, you hit the right note. You said, "Hey, look here. We're we're learning out this thing." Of all of all people who were in Oregon, who are definitely supposed to know what's going on is Bill Currier. He happens to be the chair of the Republican God, Party. Good to see you. It's been right. a while. So it's a timely thing, Bill, because he's given us an update, if you will, of last week here in Oregon and from a national perspective to a local. So he started out with Betsy DeVos. Well, I, I can tie that to the state. Okay. So, as this was happening on Wednesday. In fact, as I got, right after I got to the Evergreen Air and Space, Aviation and Space Museum, sure. I found out uh, our Secretary of Education here in Oregon resigned abruptly and immediately. It wasn't even like a planned thing. Well, in advance, okay, I'm turning in my resignation and then we'll have a smooth transition between now and the end of the year. No, it was literally, a, I'm done as of now. What? And Governor Brown was out of the country. Wait, wait a minute. So wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Now, this, the education chairperson for the state of Oregon yes. resigned. On the day that our federal secretary of education, Betsy DeVos, was in McMinnville learning about the success, success that they're having helping students develop career pathways, our own secretary of education in the state of Oregon, nowhere to be found. I resign my position as of now, and here's our governor over in Asia doing a trade mission. Wow. And wow. I'll give credit to Representative Newt Bueller, who's the presumed front runner for the Republican Party's right. nomination for governor next okay. year. He jumped on it and he pointed out that this is the latest in the round of revolving doors that we've had in the executive branch. And this is true because I remember you would have expected that when she took over as governor after Kitzhaber yeah, resigned, yeah, that yeah. she would have replaced some of the department heads, people that were loyal to Kitzhaber. Yeah. And I'll tell you what it looks like from my standpoint as a chief of staff in the Oregon Senate, because we work with these agencies and every agency has legislative liaisons who help mm -hmm. us with constituent mm -hmm. issues. And so we have a directory like this that the Department of Administrative Services puts out and it has all the agency directors, all their legislative liaisons. So after she took over and we started getting this turnover, I'd have to go and cross them out and say, okay, this guy's moved on, replaced by this guy. This guy too. And so after a while, about half of the one from 2015 was crossed out. Hmm. But DAS then gave us another one for 2017, which is fine. I'm in the same situation now where I'm having to go wow. through and cross wow. out. Wow. And that's bad from a constituent hmm. services standpoint. And I'll tell you why. Um, one of the key officials at DEQ stepped down. And he was always very professional. I always really liked working with him. We had a constituent issue involving a dry cleaners in Ashland and sent it to the agency and the director. And this is one of those things that the legislative liaison who'd been there for about eight years would have taken care of immediately mm. because he was very effective, very good mm. at what he does, except he isn't there anymore. They haven't filled the position. And so we, we hear back from right. our constituents saying, hey, well, what's going on? Am I still going to be in business next month? Mm -hmm. And so we had to bring it to the director's office again. And to his credit, he apologized profusely and said, well, I, this has been on my desk. This is something he would have taken care yeah. of. And I said, yeah, no, I, I figured that's something that he would have done. But that's that's what it kind of means from in terms of services to the people of Oregon when you have this kind of revolving door situation happening in multiple agencies. And you have some of the largest agencies in this state with the biggest budgets that have been operating with interim directors. Hmm. Now, the Oregon Health Authority was one of them, right? The agency director got fired for attempting to launch a smear campaign against one of the coordinated care organizations. Mm -hmm. Their secret communication plan mm -hmm. got leaked mm -hmm. uh, and it just made it look really bad. Now, luckily with the health authority, it's being taken over by Patrick Allen 
who's been in charge of the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. And I've worked with Pat Allen for years when okay. he was in that role. He's also very professional, very competent. I think out of anybody that could be in charge of the health authority, he's the best pick. Mm. But now we've got all these changes happening to the Affordable Care Act, and we don't have a DCBS director, right? That position is currently being advertised. So the good news is we have a good person in charge of the health authority, but the bad news is the position that he left in order to take that position is vacant at a time when we really need some continuity there. Mm. Continuity is the key word, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that's wow. kind of what we found with a lot of these different agencies. So our, our director of education steps down the day that Betsy DeVos comes to town. I mean, the timing couldn't have been worse for the Brown administration and is replaced by Governor Brown's chief education innovation officer, mm, mm. Right? maybe on an interim basis, maybe on a permanent well, basis, know, but you talk about the things that are important okay. in the state, healthcare, oh, yeah, oh, education, yeah. education that, we need a director. As, as primo one, and in all due respect, we went through that process suggesting that an elected superintendent was not the way to go. Remember that? Well, and that was because you, a Republican almost won that election, no, Ron but, but still, But still, yeah. we went through that process. So in all due respect, Oregonians felt that, hey, all of a sudden it's going to really be important because now the governor is going to be the superintendent. Right. So when you mentioned about the fact that, hey, someone just stepped, I was thinking immediately it was going to be the governor. <laughs> That's where my mind was because she is the chief person, if you will, representing the education community. Now, all of a sudden, this, this situation, it, it, it's, 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 it's annoying. It's, it's, ridic it's ridiculous. What do you think about that, Bill? Well, I'm jumping in the middle part. of a... <laughs> That's okay. No, you're doing That's great. okay. You're doing Happy fine. to have you're you doing here. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Education piece. What do you think? Well, I think it's symptomatic of an underlying problem uh, where... The focus isn't on leading and managing. Yeah. It's 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 quite honestly on hyper partisan uh, showmanship yeah. and, and grandstanding and responding to crisis. <clears throat> it's lurching from crisis to crisis, and no one's thinking where are we going to be five years from now, ten years from now. Right. It's more reactive than proactive. I mean, we're talking about carbon caps yeah. in the midst of devastating fires in Oregon, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's just a misplaced mm -hmm. sort of um, agenda that is really focused on partisan differences rather than on what's best for the people of Oregon. And I'm glad you mentioned that too because that's one of the things that I'm going to be doing tomorrow. They have these series of work groups now, four different work groups that are going to be working on cap and trade legislation to try to get it in for the February session. They have an extremely ambitious timeline because you have so many stakeholders involved and they have a November 21st deadline to submit legislation to legislative council so they okay. can have time okay. to draft okay. it for the February okay. session. Okay. So that's kind of what we're up against. and. This thought that you're going to get that many stakeholders uh, all on the same page in such a short period of time with such a complex issue to get it passed in the short session, I, I don't think good policy can result from that. Mm -hmm. Any other highlights you there before we get into it? I got one, one other as far as the administration area, as far as Oregon is concerned. And uh, I noticed that the Attorney General, Ellen uh, Rosenbaum, I was, I've had this out. Rosenblum. Yeah. Rosenblum, right? Fired her Justice Department investigator over Black Lives Matter profiling scandal. I thought that was very interesting. Wasn't that essentially uh, that the agency was spying on its person that's supposed to be taking yeah, care of he, and monitoring and he was civil the rights? <laughs> and it was, he, he was, it's something like E-R-I-O-U-S, Johnson Jr., okay? And his wife and, had been on Kitzhaber's staff. Well, besides that, his wife is now the chairman, of, and she's the chairman director of the Urban League here locally. Another African American, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just trying to figure out well, now, what the world's going on. I mean, the, the Democratic Party is really having some problems with their um, with their so-called African Americans, you know, in the party. And it, and it's interesting that some of the leaderships here in the Portland metropolitan area are all supporting this gentleman, if you will. Everybody, I mean, people are really concerned about uh, the fact that uh, the Attorney General has fired this person. First, they fired him. They fired him, and then gave him two hundred thousand dollars. And then at the same time said, you can't be, you can't work for government for the next nine years. Well, well sort of like the whistleblower well, with $300,000, uh, same, same sort of lack of transparency. You know, there's always going to be shakeups and yeah, changes, yeah, yeah, and changes of administration. Yeah, 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 right. uh, we would expect that. Uh, right. A new leader comes in, they make changes. But when, when there's always a m mystery around every yeah, yeah, one, yeah. that's the pattern. And... Mm -hmm. And why don't we know what's really going on right. with these um, changes? Right. The changes should be explained and explainable. Right, right. So. And, and so much is going on. You really don't have enough time, if you will, to try to figure out how to deal with all these different issues. Well, that's a major issue. The sad part is really, I mean, uh, quite honestly, is for Oregonians, it reduces their confidence in government, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they see sort of things in disarray 
and they wonder what's going on, whether they can count on things like this business that doesn't know whether they're going to get the answers they need. Yeah. It's uh, it's not a way to run a business, much less the government. Yeah, so. tough job. You said you had one other point you want to make, then we're going to jump right in. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to mention piece. here, I mean, one of the national scandals that's happening right now that we're seeing is where longtime movie producer Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. is under all kinds of pressure now, a huge controversy over the way that he's treated women over the years. Now, if I remember right, Chairman Courier, Harvey Weinstein donated $5,000 to the Democratic Party of Oregon. As far as I know, they haven't returned that donation. No, or 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 even hinted that they would. Was oh, that right? Yeah. It, 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 he's given a lot of money. He's, he's given several hundred thousand dollars to the National Democratic Party. But our our concern is that most Democrats have now said they're going to return that money or give it to mm, a charity. Okay. okay right. Yeah, or right. Uh, right. But. Not here in Oregon. The Democratic Why? Party of Oregon presumably still holding on to that $5,000. And this brings up a larger point, too, because I think part of where the Democrats lost themselves the last couple of election cycles is that they've lost touch with your blue-collar, everyday people and who were responsive to Donald Trump and his kind of message. And what you've seen instead is that they're becoming more of a regional party of more of elitists and so they're in this position now the extent to which you defend and don't hide from people like harvey weinstein you lose touch with the average person mm -hmm. and for too long the democratic party nationally has catered to these hollywood elites guys like leonardo dicaprio who want to fly private jets all around the world and tell me to reduce my carbon footprint right telling mm -hmm. the average guy hey yeah, you know, exactly. you're impacting the environment too much it's just called come on man i'm just trying to pay my electricity bill like everybody else and if we enact the policies you're insisting on that's going to triple and that's going to make it hard for my family right. and so at the end of the day the democratic party nationally is going to have to decide who they really side with is it the working people People in states like Wisconsin and Oregon, or is it people like Harvey Weinstein? Mm -hmm. It's well, Hollywood elites that are trying to tell the rest of us how to live. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the contrast really comes in where uh, the Democrat Party itself considers it the voice of the working man, the yeah, working person, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So and identifying with the black suit, same thing. And, 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 and exactly, yep, uh, and various on, communities, on, on. Uh, which is all good, yeah, but their yeah, policies yeah, yeah. and their partisan behavior, especially lately, really indicates that they're not really really most interested in that mm -hmm. uh, set of issues, but r rather in pursuing a partisan agenda which, which pushes back against mm -hmm. a president that they still haven't accepted, mm -hmm. or uh, a, you know, um, a, a other people in office in Oregon, for example, Dennis Richardson, they're pushing back, even though he's doing a fantastic job mm -hmm. as our new Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. So. Why is that? Why put all that energy? I think voters, regardless of political party, expect government to do its job. Mm -hmm. Whoever they elect, mm -hmm. Republican or Democrat, mm -hmm. they expect them to do their job. And when it becomes partisan and not serving the people, then they should be concerned. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, what we're saying. I might, I might add also, too, that uh, the Democratic Party chair was also invited to this no session that we were going to have. And you, know, as you can see there's a no show and I'm still open. I'm still open. And the reason why I'm making that point, this is not a bashing of the Democratic Party, is about some of the issues, some of the major issues that we have, not only in the state, but in this country for that matter. And, uh, you know, even though we, as you've identified a lot of the things that are happening in regards to the Democratic Party, even from a national to local aspect, right? but, but Bill and his party gets, still gets to hit in a negative way. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the information is shared, no, but still, regardless, the Republican Party is still responsible. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Are you, are you understand? Yeah, I, I, the, the, there needs to. I mean, the, the concept of a, a multi-party system. It, right. it has been two main parties for mm -hmm. ages. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a, an independent party that is growing in size in Oregon. It gives people a choice, an option. There needs to be opposition. Yeah. There's nothing wrong sure. with the concept yeah. of opposition. Yeah. We should embrace that because it gives more voice it puts more voices around the table to discuss differing views but when one party rules arrogantly mm -hmm. and does not take care of the citizens th that's not the design of the system and the other party the other players or the people at the table have no voice mm -hmm. that's not the that's not the concept and so that's where that's what Oregon is struggling with right now is decades of policy that has not benefited the people mm -hmm. and the party in power is not accommodating any other perspectives mm -hmm. or positions. Mm -hmm. Well tell me this Bill, you're out there, you're out there, you're walking, you're, you're knocking on doors, you're, you're all over Oregon for that matter and, 
And are you seeing any change? Are you seeing? Absolutely. Are you seeing some change? Okay. Well, um, you know, we in President Trump's election, we talk about Middle America or uh, the uh, the forgotten man and woman that mm -hmm. he talked about in his mm -hmm. inauguration speech. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're starting to see in, in Oregon. We're starting to see people get say, I'm fed up. I'm fed up with a government that's off track, uh, leaders that are not responding to the needs of the people. They seem to be more interested in political activities than they, you know, like pushing back on the president. Mm -hmm. uh, you, got, you know, Governor Brown has a tough job. Any governor does. Yeah. But when she's focusing her time on resisting the federal government, mm -hmm. And yeah, in so doing, right. and so doing, upholding the violation of law rather than upholding the law itself, mm -hmm. which government's first job is to provide for the protection and safety of its citizens and its and the welfare of those people. Mm -hmm. And instead, we're, we're you know we have pushback yeah, and obstruction yeah. and 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 it's not it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. It's it's not. Well, well, you know, you there's, there's always a winning side and a losing side, and, and one side gets to govern for a while, you know, with their right. perspective or policies, but when the energy instead is, is used to just um, divide, then it, it doesn't serve any purpose. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of priorities, too. Okay, mm -hmm. what are your priorities as governor of Oregon? Are your priorities to make sure that these really expensive agencies are being run properly? Or is your priority to bash the president at every available opportunity and hope to God he doesn't decide to pull our federal funds <laughs> right over sanctuary cities or over some of these other issues? And even, you know, getting back to Betsy DeVos, so much of it was based on ideology because, you know, some of my friends on the left saw that I was going to be with Secretary DeVos right. and I didn't meet her. I was in the room during the discussion, right? But I had things to do so I didn't get to do the photo op or shake hands. There. But I was there. <laughs> and, and so much of it was just based in ideology and kind of demonizing her. Oh, she's poison. She hates teachers. And I says, well, that's funny because the teachers and administrators that were in the room seemed to like her just fine and she seemed to like them just fine. This isn't about ideology. This is about the Department of Ed Education, which yeah. was founded by Jimmy Carter before I was even born, and everyone seems to agree that this agency is not functioning as well as it should. Right. Kids are graduating from high school unskilled, right? Unemployable as far as a lot of employers are concerned, and that's a big yeah. issue for them now. We, is we ought to be celebrating the fact that the national level of our government, uh, Betsy DeVos, is is caring enough to come to Oregon, which is one of the smallest of the states population-wise, and look at our issues because we're at the bottom of the ranking for yes. production in, in education and we're at the top of the ranking for cost, mm -hmm. right? And so the fact that she's taking some time to look at that issue uh, and perhaps provide a federal perspective is really important. I think we ought to be celebrating that. Not uh, she's in office. She's been appointed. Yeah. We have a new president. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we can push, you know, the energy can but be she, towards pushing education. back or it can be towards what do we do, we do with right, these resources right, right. and these people that have been duly elected right. to bring about the change that we need to put Oregon more towards the middle of the pack right, at least, right, you know? Right, and then right. later on we can start looking at, right. at being at the top of the pack on, on well, in all producing respect, students. Well, that's why so. we have you today here, and that's why we have this gentleman here. He, even though he's at the legislature, he happens to be of Hispanic descent, if you will. Okay. And, but he's a My mother is a Mexican national, he, he, it's he, true. He, he, in all due respect, but the bottom line is that they are documented <laughs> Americans, if you will. Well, and if you know, well, I've got a flag, I've got a tie here to, to pick just that today. I mean, all of the various cultures are on here, the flags, the whole, and even, hey, there it is right there. You know what I'm saying? So, so the fact of the matter is, we got another issue on the table, and that is, uh, we got the sanctuary city deal. The state of California has gone all sanctuary city aspect of it, and they are but us, if you will. And so, it's something that it's going to have. Some, it's a major impact here in Oregon, and so we need to discuss our issues in terms of what impact will this have on us, and where do we go from here. So let's have that discussion. First off, Bill, why don't you take some time, because I know you have been speaking to this subject matter throughout the state of Oregon, to a number of groups, including even the Portland metropolitan area and elsewhere, where, where there's going to be a major impact in this, in this area also, too. But uh, would you just share with us a bit, one, about your traveling, and, and what, what do you feel? Well, let's first, let's define what the, the sanctuary city means, because a lot of lay folks don't know. Got me? Define what that is, and then get some sense of, where are we going with this issue right now? You know, <clears throat> that's really a good uh, opening there, Bruce, because 
sanctuary itself is such a positive context mm -hmm. word. When you talk about giving something sanctuary, somebody's sanctuary, you're protecting yeah, them. How could you be against sanctuary? How could sanctuary? you be against sanctuary? But when the sanctuary is for criminals, mm -hmm. right, it turns a good word into a bad word. Because why would you give criminals greater protection than the average citizen? And that's, that, therein lies the problem. And it really relates back to what you were talking about earlier, which I see as sort of a lawlessness. You know, we're going to fight the federal government, even though we're in the wrong in terms of the law. And now on immigration, we're going to fight the federal government, even though President Trump has made it very clear he's going after the criminals mm -hmm. who are being provided sanctuary. So when I was back in D.C. a few weeks ago, we talked about um, House Resolution uh, 3003, which is... Um, uh, called No Sanctuary for Criminals, mm -hmm. and it was about defunding jurisdictions that provide this sanctuary for criminals. Mm -hmm. We have to separate. What's going on here is it's one side is trying to make it all about racial, and the other side is all about rule of law. In other words, are we going to follow the law? Are we going to have laws that we follow? And if we don't like the laws, we work to change them. Mm -hmm. Or are we just going to do whatever we want because we oppose the law? In other words, lawlessness. And the other side is just trying to make it about racial mm -hmm. and bigotry mm -hmm. and so on. When, when really the issue comes down to are you following the law or not? Whether you're a government official or you're a citizen or you're undocumented, the question is are you following the law? And if you're breaking the law, those that are causing harm to others, like happened here with Mr. Martinez, uh, you know, here in, in, in Portland, in Portland yes. who, who raped the woman and right. tried to go on and do it to another person, another woman a little while later. Horrendous set of, of acts. He'd been deported 20 times, right? And here he is back because he gets released. And why does he get released? Politically motivated release in order to avoid ICE taking him into custody. And that's law enforcement. That's law enforcement. <laughs> I mean, I right? So you've got a criminal who's right. breaking the law that right. we should be going after, regardless right. of his citizenship right. status. Right. Right. And he's being protected greater than the criminal who is a citizen, mm -hmm. who wouldn't have been let go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when people hear this stuff, it doesn't matter if they're rural or they're urban. It doesn't matter if they're on the east side or in, in Portland proper. They're, they're like, why would we allow these criminals to exist? And the other thing that I just find amazing is these criminals are going into the communities that they are native to and causing the most harm in those exactly. communities, right? Exactly. So when we say we're trying to take care of these folks, well, the best thing that we could do to take care of them is to remove the criminals from their mm -hmm. presence, mm -hmm. right? And, and yet it is all about racial. And that's, it's such a distortion of the real issue, which is are we going to follow the law or not? And and it are, is the government going to follow the law or not? Mm -hmm. I think that's what it really boils down <clears throat> to, too, because, you know, you simplify this all day long, right? And what I like about our system, I believe in rule of law. A and I think that's what this was all founded upon, was this, uh, this notion that we are all equal under the law. Mm -hmm. But a situation is being created where some of the laws apply some of the time to some of the people in Depending some places. Depending on your political... Yeah. Uh, and, and your geography. Okay, yeah. so you're you're in this particular city at this point in time, so therefore the law doesn't apply to you, but it applies to everywhere else. And I think sometimes, in the name of political correctness, people go a little too far with this stuff. In the 2013 session, this law was passed, and, and people will remember this, that would have provided driver cards, the I equivalent of a driver's yeah, license, yeah. for yeah. folks who are undocumented. Yeah. Yeah. Well... People didn't like that. Yeah. They gathered signatures and they put it on the ballot. And I remember doing a, a group of a bunch of focus groups all over the state in early 2014. Mm -hmm. And I I knew there and then, because even the most liberal of liberals in our focus groups, yeah. when we brought up this issue, would get literally violently angry mm -hmm. and say, what do you mean mm -hmm. you're going to give driver cards mm -hmm. to folks with no established legal presence? Mm -hmm. says, that's outrageous. Mm -hmm. Flawlessness. And when it came up, you know, <laughs> Oregon bucked the trend nationally in 2014 because it was a red wave literally everywhere in the country but here. Mm -hmm. But that ballot measure went down in flames because the average person, when they had that in front of them, said, you know what? This doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound fair. And this it, is not good policy. To, and to Bill's point, when that happened, uh, I tried to get into the melee, and the chairman who was, a, who was running it was a male, white male, and he was called a racist. Oh, and so as a result, he came on the show, we talked about this whole issue, and as a result, he then appointed a new chair as a female, i.e. minority type, but a white female, but my point is that he, he appointed her. But the whole issue of racism, so we discussed that issue. 
And the, and the idea was that the point that we were trying to make is that what was, how did this, how did it er derive? How was it derived? Who signed off on this deal here in Oregon? Was it the Democratic Party? Was it the Republican Party? And who specifically <laughs> brought up the issue <laughs> and lobbied the issue to get this before the legislature and get this passed? Right. You, you know, there were some business <laughs> interests involved. <laughs> oh, some really? Republicans oh, supported really? well, it that, because of those yeah. agricultural I think they were interests. Called farmers in or something. <laughs> but still, understand that's a point. Well, and that, they tried in the 2014 session, if I remember right, to um, make your point. Then we're going to take a short break, and then we'll okay, come right back. To okay. kind of rig the process, which is what they they're going to do with with the uh, health care tax. That's right. That's uh, coming up. We will talk about that. But Bill is on the job. I know he is. Okay, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back, folks. Don't leave. Change your coffee. Get more tea. Okay, folks, welcome back, if you will. We're talking about Sanctuary City. We're going to just get right back in the discussion where we, we were. And uh, I think we left off from the standpoint of how was this, this law derived, if you will, uh, of whatever, this makeup of Sanctuary City. Now, did it start from a national perspective? And then it come down to the state of Oregon? And when it came down to the state of Oregon, what did it go? Did it go to the legislature? And then which part of the house did it go? <clears throat> Our side or these side? Who wrote up? Who wrote up the, the legislature? And you know about that stuff, about the writing up stuff, Scott. Oh yeah. Where, where did it come from, Scott? <laughs> when I was talking about the driver card issue, that was <laughs> stuff that happened in 2013, 2014. But look, here's the political reality of this. At the end of the day, Governor Brown is up for re-election next year. She's already filed. She's raised a lot of money, and. The Democrats have been good at catering to different minority groups. And, okay. you know, conservatives aren't as good at that because we kind of take the approach that we want to create opportunity for everybody. We want the American dream for everybody. But what they do is they tell different minority groups that you're a victim and the only yeah. way that you'll stop mm -hmm. being a victim is if you give us more power mm. and let us take more of other people's money. Mm. But then decades later, you're telling them the same thing, mm. and eventually they mm. say, well, didn't you tell me that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 but, years but, ago? But so I'm me, still a victim, and you've gotten more power and more money, but, and I'm still a victim. But, but still, oh. do me a favor. <laughs> Give me a name. I want to represent if so-and-so brought this issue up to the table, or Senator so-and-so office into the sale, whether Republican or the Democrat. Who brought up the issue before the legislature? That's what I'm looking for. In terms of sanctuary? Yes. Yeah, well, me, me I mean, some. it's 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 been a sort of a um, I don't want to say organic, but a a widespread phenomenon associated with the election of a president that they just couldn't accept. So that's that's number one. This pushback, the the whole sanctuary concept has been around for a long time. You've, we've been talking about this for a number of years. Under Obama, we were talking about uh, places that people were protecting people, churches and other institutions protecting people, you know, that were here illegally or or running from the law, so to speak. But right now, it's become political. Right. It's right. become very political. And so here in Oregon, <clears throat> just as an example, uh, you know, to answer your question, Bruce, is there have been, um, think about, uh, well, Measure 88 with a driver's card okay. uh, was, was sort of a way to say, look, people that are here illegal shouldn't be getting benefits that only citizens should be getting. Right. right? right. People objected to that concept. Right. But then when Trump was elected, they took a law, and it specifically it was ORS 181.820-A, or A. Mm -hmm. So 181.820-A, I know that's kind of techy uh, in terms of the law, but that is known as the, uh, they've, Kate Brown, or Governor Brown, has built an obstruction or resistance movement in large part based on this taking an existing law and reinterpreting it 
mm. to turn Oregon into a sanctuary uh, state. Okay. And this law says, here's what the law says, <clears throat> it's, it's 30 years old. Okay. And yet it's become the basis for mm. turning Oregon into a sanctuary state. And the, what the law said was that law enforcement in Oregon could not use resources, money, time, energy, mm -hmm. to go after people whose only offense was that they were here illegally. Okay, so that was the point of 181, ORS 181. The reasoning for that was they didn't want state resources, or local resources even, to be utilized to enforce a federal law mm -hmm. when there were no felonies or major crimes involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. They have since reinterpreted that to mean no cooperation and no communication mm -hmm. with the federal authorities. So mm -hmm. active obstruction. And active, active obstruction, mm -hmm. and, that, and thus create this sanctuary haven in mm. Oregon for criminals. Because if you're a criminal, if you're here illegally and you're intent on committing crimes, where are you going to go? Where's the best place for you to go to commit crimes? Mm. Is it a non-sanctuary non or a sanctuary? Sanctuary. Yeah, and that reminds me, I remember <laughs> see, seeing a <laughs> headline run, or, on... Or, or, or commit it and run into the sanctuary city boundaries. You know you know where the boundaries when are. When you, you know... Ollie Ollie oxen free. <laughs> yeah, you know that you're going to, if you get apprehended, yeah, yeah. you're going to be released yeah. prior yeah. to mm -hmm. you going into federal custody mm -hmm. because the feds are going to take you out. Yeah. Right? right. They're going right, to take right. you out of the right. country. Exactly. Uh, they have the resources, right. that's their job, right. to right. enforce right. our borders, right? It's not the state's job to enforce the borders, and that's part of the reason for 181. So there was nothing really wrong with that law, except that it's been utilized now to create this sanctuary status. Okay. But still, I, I'm not trying to be too insistent, but I'm still looking for those individuals who carried that legislation. Forward. Well, Governor Brown pushed that. Governor pushed Brown. That change. Now, what about what about the representatives in each of the areas in both R's and D's? Uh, Who picked that? I, I don't think that individual Republican legislators were too okay. thrilled about I don't, this idea. The I don't think there's a any lot of them were adamantly opposed behind, to yeah. it. Right, right, right. Yeah. You, you get my point. My point is that too often we tend to talk about the issue, but we need to let the let the let the public know, Oregonians know. Well, again, that was that was issue. another one of the bills that was proposed that was really controversial because, if you'll remember, Oregon voters voted overwhelmingly to pass a ballot measure to provide more services to our veterans. Yeah. And the governor and her recommended budget <laughs> took money away from the Veterans Administration. And then during the session, they were pushing a bill to provide health care to everybody in the state, all children in the state, regardless of, so the of idea, status. So less for veterans and... Yes, or put another way, I, that's a great point, is m the voters at the ballot said we want to set aside additional, not replacement, right. but additional money to help veterans, right? And what did the governor do? Came along and said, well, I'm going to take money out of their budget, wow. thus depleting it wow. and, and, and negating what the voters did. Well, there was a young that, lady that's well known <clears throat> on the other side that brought that issue up. She was the one that got the money. What was, you know, you know what Representative Julie Parrish. Julie Parrish. She'd been working on that yeah. issue so for Julie years. Julie Parrish is the one that put that piece together. Yep. And I'm just saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying the same thing with reference to this whole issue of con uh, Sanctuary City. Someone had to have been identified as carrying that piece. I hate to be so, so insistent. It was a priority, <laughs> it was a priority for Democratic well, leadership in both chambers. Both and chambers. here's the thing you have to remember about this last election. Voters also overwhelmingly rejected Measure 97. Mm -hmm. They said, no, we do not want this tax increase. We do not want, except they were pushing different versions of that, right? So they were ignoring these ballot measures that people passed overwhelmingly and kept trying to do, oh, this corporate activities tax. And a lot of folks said, this sounds surprisingly like the ballot measure that we just overwhelmingly so voted down. So Measure 97 down. goes down hard because the voters mm -hmm. vote against it. Mm -hmm. And then they spend the whole, most of the session yeah, mm -hmm. right up until trying to compensate for that by raising taxes in all these mm -hmm. other areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. by doing a, a uh, light version of it not, while you know, ignoring these I ballot measures. I would say that's that, not listening to the yeah, voters. That's right, that's right. <laughs> That's right. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. But my point is that I think that's kind of like where we need to start on this issue. So we're going to really understand what is going on. You got me. Uh, there, there were some beneficiaries behind that that situation. There's, there's money behind. You know, it's always. It's a lot of times it's economics aspect of it. But theirs is a passion for freedom or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the masses. And when you think about the about the, uh, the situation where. We basically, we, we basically, uh, let's see, we, we gave, if you will, citizenship to two batches, two groups of individuals, 
they were from Mexico at one point in time. Remember that? The amnesty yeah. in the, the 80s. The amnesty in the 80s. No due respect to President Reagan. Which is the last time you had an overhaul President of this system. Yeah, I was Reagan a child. President Bush <laughs> did the same thing. <laughs> it's been thing. a while. But then now all of a sudden, it, it, my point is that recognizing the fact that a lot of those folks were Catholics when they came here, even in that first batch, and it's like anything else, you know, people are fam very family oriented, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden say, well, gee, just come on over. You know what I mean? Because they're going to give you freedom. They're going to give you a, a free ride, and you don't have to worry about going through this process. So, America I mean, just, was just built, as we yes. all know, yes. on this melting pot yes. concept. Yes. But, it, but it has to be a melting pot. Yes. In other words, yes. there has to be integration. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. It's yes. a melting pot. Yes. It means we all mix together mm -hmm. and be, we become one. Mm -hmm. If you if if it never gets mixed and it's these separate right. lumps, right. Exactly. right? Exactly. we lose all of our strength exactly. as a country. Exactly. And, and I think most Americans, deep down, yes. understand that. Yes. Yes. yes, And they understand that when people don't truly... I, you know... The people in various communities that are of uh, that have immigrated here, whatever those communities yeah. might be, Russian, Hispanic, yeah. uh, well, whatever over, it might be, here, here in <laughs> Oregon, when I talk to most of the members of and the leaders of those communities, they say, "We want to follow the law. Right. We we object when people come into our community, even from our own ethnic background, and cause problems in our community. And we expect the government to protect exactly. us. Exactly. We're here exactly. legally. We exactly. followed the rules. Exactly. They didn't. Yes. Right." Okay. And so when we say, oh, you know, we're going to protect the immigrants, that's not what they're doing. Right. They're protecting the criminals, yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and they're hurting the immigrants. Mm -hmm. Because you're an immigrant when you're following the law. But a lot of, a lot of times they don't see that. I'm talking about well, it's it's an appeal to the, the emotional flag. side of the yes. argument instead of the logistical yes. Yes. and... and um, uh, fact-based side right. of the argument. Well, that's not, and that's well, become kind of the default <laughs> since the election, and it's been going on for a long time, and it's emblematic of the politically correct culture okay. that we've seen for, for as long as I can remember that seems to be falling apart at the seams, realistically, because that's been kind of the calling card of the left is when you're losing the argument, scream racist, regardless mm -hmm. of, you know, and I have people doing that to me, too. Oh, yeah. Calling, oh, yeah. And I'm oh, saying, yeah. okay, oh, that's yeah. hilarious, oh, yeah. you know, that I'll tell my Mexican national mother yeah, that right. white if, privilege if liberals go, are calling me racist. <laughs> if you go to a group, conversation all day. <laughs> yeah, if you go to a group of 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans and you ask them all the same question, are, are you for immigration? Guess what nine at least out of them, of each, groups will, each group will say? We're for immigration. Yeah, right. We support immigrants. Right. They will both say that. Well, then what's the difference between you? What's the difference? Well, and this is another one of those so, issues, kind of like North Korea and that crisis, where this can has been kicked down the road for decades. You were talking mm, about how, yeah. you know, under Reagan was the last time there was any comprehensive overhaul yeah. of these policies. Mm -hmm. That was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the extent to which something can be done about it now and, and you know this yeah, kind of piggyback a monster on. to deal with now it got out of it has well, gotten out of hand. hand yeah yeah it's going totally and we, and we can't to take a draft you know yeah. i mean everybody i think everybody recognizes we can't solve this problem overnight yeah. It, yeah. It, people are here their lives are vested they've been living here legal or not the question is how we're going to deal with it mm -hmm. and i and i think that one side has made it sort of all about politics mm -hmm. and emotion mm -hmm. and race mm -hmm. instead of about what do we do with the law to mm -hmm. to to fix this problem mm -hmm. so that we stop we stop people from being here illegally and mm -hmm. particularly committing crimes mm -hmm. illegally mm -hmm. and we build a strong america where everybody becomes part of this country you know, the truly other, a, a part of this country yeah and the other sad side about this whole situation the bulk of those individuals who are undocumented it's unfortunate they can dig in themselves a deeper hole from the standpoint of not being able to get it to the point where they can have a discussion about this piece. See what I mean? So we can move forward. So, But, they, but if you're constantly, i.e., just basically raising the Mexican flag and, and i.e., you got to speak Spanish before this, it's, it's English as a second language, all those little things are sort of attributed to them now. It's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. And if we don't have that discussion, and then now, even now, with the president elect Trump, was trying to bring it to the table to have that discussion is just quote i.e. CNN and Fox. You know, well, Fox, he was elected yeah. on that platform though. Yeah, yeah. It's Immigration not like he... was the first issue he yeah. Yeah. Uh, brought forward and ran on. And people and, responded. And people care he, about he it. He won overwhelmingly care in about the primaries issue. across but, the But it's country. not because one side doesn't like yeah, immigrants. Right, that's right, the, right, that's right. the narrative that's yeah, being pushed. Right. One side doesn't like one right, uh, right. immigrants and one side does. No, the issue is how do we solve this problem 
by following the law or changing the law to fix the problem. But you remember now, the biggest thing, the reason why he got elected was because of the, the, uh, the media and Congress. Remember that? <laughs> we had to clean the swamp. I thought it was Russia. It was, it was, it was clean the swamp. That's what I heard. It was sure. these and our, both in many ways. You got my it, point? It was, let's do and something so it, different. It, it and so this, all, this all reminds me, you know, there was a story a few weeks back on Oregon Public Broadcasting. And the headline, it's one of the greatest headlines ever. And I say this as, as a former really? reporter, said, okay. uh, people arrested who committed no crime except being here illegally. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> how, how do you reconcile that? And, and a lot of this, to me, also gets back to... Okay, so if you were to go to Mexico right. illegally and try well, to do the same and be thing, there, it, what would happen to you? Yes. You wouldn't what would get happen? a phone what call. Would you anybody, wouldn't get an anybody, attorney. Yeah, you would what, be yeah, locked right, up right. indefinitely. Particularly on their southern border. You try to cross that southern border. In Mexico. Yeah, that's... You should see their wall. <laughs> yeah, all this talk about a wall, their wall they, on their southern border. They, they treat illegal uh, aliens uh, harshly. But folks didn't Very know harshly. That. Folks didn't know that. That's why, in all due respect, that's why I wanted to have the. No, we don't want to be the only country chair. on earth that just lets. But 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 this isn't like about that. you know, Hispanics. No, or, right. No, it's, it's about no, no. those who are attempting to follow the law, and those who aren't, it's the, it's including the, our government officials who are bolstering the non-following of the law about, by creating sanctuaries. It's about the glue that keeps this country together. Yeah. With all these cultures all under one roof, my friend, you got to have some standard, if you will. If we lose the standard, we have no America. Well, what's the what's the number one thing that government can do for its citizens? It's provide, and it's a very simple concept. It's mm -hmm. provide certainty, mm -hmm. right? A level, fair playing field, mm -hmm. right? We don't government doesn't pick the winners and losers, mm -hmm. but it does ensure a fair level playing field. And when government then takes a class of residents and elevates them above another class, mm -hmm. as they're doing with the criminals mm -hmm. in the sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Providing greater, they mm -hmm. even have a fund in Portland mm -hmm. wow. for illegal aliens for criminal defense that you don't get if you're I'm a sure citizen. homeless veterans would say, "Wow, right. I'd I love to have." What about some veterans? Of that. What about yeah. uh, homeless? Yeah. Why, 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 why wouldn't we get veterans? They're citizens. Why wouldn't we give them a fund protect you know to defend and protect them? So it's really politically, unfortunately, it's politically driven. Wow, and that's the sad truth of it. So we got to. You're absolutely right. We got to get beyond that. Yeah, we have to. We got to get beyond that and talk about how do we provide for the job of government mm -hmm. for all that people. has to work. It has to work. That has to work because otherwise, even if the healthcare situation aspect of it, they don't even have to worry about the healthcare. I mean, all due respect, <laughs> I, I've gone to a medical situation and and um, you look at the there's only one line. And when in all due respect, when an undocumented worker up, no problem, name go. When a, when a documented worker comes in, oh no, you got to fill these extra payments back. And if you don't have the insurance and you don't have your card, you don't get service. Well, it, and it's all about enforcement too. At the end of the day, and we have all kinds of problems in our programs, even our visa programs, where people, thousands of people, routinely overstay their visas. Yeah, yeah. And they don't yeah, check in, and they don't yeah. do what has been required of them in order to get those visas. Yeah. But there's no penalty for it mm -hmm. on the other end. Mm -hmm. And I think most countries, if you overstayed your visa and they found out about it, mm -hmm. would detain you mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. throw you out, mm -hmm. deport you. Yep. Uh, but this is something that this country has done a very poor job of doing well, for a very long time. Here's another example. So we talked about a uh, uh, House bill or resolution 3003 in Congress that was that passed the House and went on to the Senate, which was about uh, defunding sanctuary, crim mm -hmm. criminal sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kind of a no-brainer, if you ask me. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna uphold the law, then we're we're gonna defund your law enforcement. Mm -hmm. This is for in terms of federal dollars. Right. The other law, 3004, most people know about. It's called Kate's Law, out of San Francisco. Uh, we remember that person also had snuck back in multiple times mm -hmm. and had committed mm -hmm. serious yeah. crimes yeah. and finally in a, a murder. Yeah. Right. That law, you would think that that it, those would both just pass. And there's another one called Davis Bacon, which um, provides uh, for greater cooperation between state and national authorities in, in regards to immigration, communication, and so no. on. Davis Bacon was prevailing wage. But I know I'm not, not, not Davis Oliver. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Davis Oliver, not yeah. Davis Bacon. Yeah. Uh, that's right. right. That's a yeah. lot, a lot older. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Like, well, I'm still waiting to hear back from one of our agencies, <laughs> Bowley, about a question we had about that actually. And so, why are these just sitting in Congress, mm -hmm. right, kind of at a standstill, when they should just be voted on? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we want fed, uh, law enforcement agencies to communicate with each other? 
to uphold the law. Because many of those individuals signed off on that deal, see, back when, and they're up yeah. for re-election. And then that's really what the issue is. Yeah. Well, but it, we it, need to know that, though. That needs to come out on the table, because how are we going to be talking about comprehensive uh, immigration if, in fact, they don't admit the fact that, hey, look, Okay, fine. Let's go back and have this well, discussion. Well, I sat, I had an opportunity a c couple of weeks ago to sit down with Wyden's staff and okay. Merkley's staff. Oh, did you? And Wyden wouldn't, at, now, we never got a meeting with their staff, but Merkley's staff we met with in his office in D.C., okay. right there near the, near, uh, the, uh, the Capitol. And these are Oregon senators. These are, or these are our Oregon's, two yes. Oregon senators. <laughs> and we said, what would it take for you to support some of these common sense right. laws, like right. 3003, 3004 right. that we were just talking How'd about? How did they react? The reaction was, well, we, we don't we don't like funding associated with any of that, so we don't want to cut funding to these. I said, okay, great. Let's take funding out of the equation. Okay. Let's say that funding has nothing to do with it. Okay. Would you would you uphold stopping criminal sanctuaries? What did you say? Well, no, it's it's more complicated. That would than compromise that. my ability to pander. And here's the thing: at the end of the day, <laughs> right? It's it, basically about brokerage. That's if exactly the federal right. government decides under this administration to stop funding providing federal funding to cities that are sanctuary cities and states, that's going to put us in a really difficult position because the state of Oregon is hugely dependent on federal funds. And so if that dries up, if federal funds to the city of Portland dry up, then the leaders of the state, the leaders of the city... We're talking millions of dollars here. We're not talking... Right. Oh, yeah. They're oh, going to yeah, have to make that money up somehow yeah. and look the voters in the eye and say, okay, I decided to do political grandstanding. Yeah. Because of that, we lost our federal funding, yeah. and now that has to come out of your pocket. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't want to put myself in that position. You know, and, and the voters in Oregon are smart enough to realize that when, when our elected officials in Oregon, whether it's the governor or the mayor of Portland, defy federal law, and put that federal funding at risk, which, by the way, they're required to examine whether we continue to receive federal funding based on our compliance with law. It's not like they're hanging this thread over our head. They're following the law when they pull the funding if we're not following the law. Mm -hmm. that's, that's built into the law. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's just politically motivated on their end. And the voters in Oregon are smart enough to recognize that when our elected officials do this defiance and put those federal dollars at risk, they're, they're risking losing millions of dollars yes, yes, into yes, Oregon. Yes. Well, you know, in all due respect, I, I tend to point, we got about nine, eight minutes or so now, but now let's talk about solutions, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking about s simplicity stuff, like defining, like defining documented and undocumented. That's easy to do, one, okay? And secondly, put it on the ballot. That's the other side of the coin, just put it on the ballot. And, and because we need to end this thing, we gotta, we gotta go forward. We need to put it on the ballot, and you know it's the majority win. It's, if it's one nothing, that's the way it is. But we need to put something on the ballot that says, "Okay, fine, this is this is where we are," and pro and con, and to get the Merkleys and whatever they can write their own piece up, and then someone else can write this other piece on this end, and, and let them vote on it. Oh, and that's, do something. That's, that's how that's the process. A, that's a start. That's how the process that the way, should work. Isn't that the way the process works? That's the way we've been living it. Well, when when, when the I mean. The, the initiative you know, petition process is really kind of a safety net for uh, the citizens of Oregon because when the legislature isn't doing what they feel they should be doing, right, 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 right. there's a process through which it can get on the ballot yeah, without yeah. coming through the legislature, yeah, without okay. being decided by the legislature, okay. where the citizens vote on it. Petition for it, a redress we, of grievances. We couldn't do everything yeah. that way because it would be too much, right? We would be deciding everything. I, so I we. Agree. We need our legislature and our elected officials who make decisions right. to do their jobs. But when ballot. they're not doing it the way we want them right. to, we have the, pro the this process to put it on the ballot and decide ourselves. The problem, though, is that when one party has been in a ruling for several decades right. Right. and they feel insulated from any accountability to the citizens, then they do things like holding off the ability to gather signatures to put it on the ballot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to avoid that... Mm -hmm. They just don't see any consequence to that. Oh, well, I could talk about some process rigging that happened in this last session. we got about session. four minutes. What about the fact we do have one, we have it on the ballot this time around, the sanctuary city, right? Well, well, uh, it would it would change 181 that I was talking about. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things, the shenanigans of the last day of the 2017 session, which was actually a good session for the most part in the was Senate. It? We didn't do very much controversial, except towards the very end, where 
some representatives, you know, some Republican representatives decided that they wanted the public to be able to vote on this provider tax okay. uh, for health care. And they've used it as a mechanism to draw federal funds. Fine. And so what they did was on party line votes in both chambers, they passed this bill to create a special election in January, which is going to cost millions of dollars to conduct. Wow. While at the same time, they were cutting the Secretary of State's office budget, right, so that he could do fewer audits and things like that, because that office is held by a Republican now for the first time in a long mm -hmm. time. So there's some politics involved. So we're going to have, if it qualifies, mm -hmm. um, a special election in January really? on, on this provider tax. Um, and the idea, the excuse, the justification was, oh, well, that way if people reject it, then we'll have to come back in the February short session to plug the funding hole that this will create. The, the, the problem, though, is the special election uh, sidesteps some processes that are very important mm -hmm. to a fair ball uh, mm -hmm. ballot item. For example, the title of something that you mm -hmm. vote on, when you say yes or no on something, yeah, right, right. that title says a lot. The word you know, tax never appears in the, yeah. in the title they you have take now. The word they tax had to file out, a lawsuit it's all about, about a tax. It. Yeah, it's right. an assessment. Exactly. That's what um, to say. So, so the process of deciding what that title is yeah. is short circuited in this mm -hmm. special yep. election. Hmm. Um, it takes the Secretary of State the out. It takes you know the Department of Ju the Attorney General. Those people that would normally be involved in deciding a fair title that people can understand and mm -hmm. relate to That's before it. they make a decision has been sidestepped, and that <laughs> that's not right. Mm -hmm. It's not right. People should be able to look at something and make a decision based yeah, on the simple. clear, plain yeah. language yeah. of what was... Will we get there? You think we'll get there at that point, that clear... Well, we, we have a court yeah. case that's pending. <laughs> a lawsuit was filed the other day to bring it before the judiciary. And bear in mind, this is all for the sake of funding an agency, the Oregon Health Authority, that was spun off from the Department of Human Services back in 2009, created out of thin air. Right, and a lot of us at the time were thinking, is this really the smartest thing? And in the meantime, both agencies' budgets have ballooned. And from a constituent services standpoint, um, if you have a healthcare issue that comes up in the legislature that you're helping constituents with, we literally have a flow chart. Right? Mm -hmm. It used to be make one phone call to this legislative liaison, but now it's okay. Well, if it's this situation, call this guy. But if it's this situation, then you'll want to go through DHS. But if it's See, this situation, you go health authority. Right? Wow. People shouldn't be faced with uncertainty when right, they look right, at government right, services. Right, right, right. It should be clear. It should be straightforward. Yeah. You asked for a solution. You know what the solution is? What is buddy? Real quick, buddy. Bringing some balance back. Yes. Where all perspectives are considered mm -hmm. and not discarded before they even have a chance to mm -hmm. argue the merits. Mm -hmm. That's where we are right now. We're in a very one-sided situation, and, and voters recognize that. We're well, getting off track. Well, as you notice here, we said we're sort of in a one-sided situation because there's a no-show <laughs> for the other side, well, the Democratic Party. I would and gladly... And I'm going to ask you guys, uh, would you mind coming <clears throat> back? If I'm able to corral him, I'll give you sort of a two-weeks notice. Depends on and, who the Seahawks are playing. They a bye week this oh week. my god yeah, this guy he'll be here uh, he, he loves it he, he loves it but anyway but no but we need to do something and we're going to do this and i want to thank both of you for being here with us and i think it's very important that we're going to really appreciate this and hopefully i can get the d here if i can get the d here then we'll we should down. have every side talking we, about this we've got to talk yep. about this issue yep. because it's impacting us all all here within the state of oregon so understand where i'm coming from and again want to thank everybody for being here with us mm -hmm. and we want to thank you the viewing audience for being here with us talk talk to you talk to your legislator call them about it call about those folks you you supported ask them the question what's the solution take care you have a good day talk to you soon <laughs>